Yeah, good morning. I'm um, happy to see such a, a good turnout for this colloquium today. Um, I will briefly introduce Professor Peskin, who is today's Severo Ochoa colloquium lecturer. He doesn't need much of an introduction for the people who work in the field of particle physics at colliders. Uh, a lot of people have learned field theory with his book. Most people have seen lectures in schools. Um, then later on, you encounter parameters named after him. So it's it's a household name in particle physics. For those outside, I'll briefly go through his career. He started in the East Coast, Harvard, Cornell, uh, and since the 80s, he's a professor at one of the the holy places of, of particle physics, uh, Slack and Stanford. Uh, he was the head of the, the theory group there for over a decade. He's a member of the American Academy. Um, I think he doesn't need much more introduction than this. So let's get going immediately. <coughs> Professor Peskin will tell us about the mysteries of the Higgs boson. I'll turn this off and okay. give the stage to you. Perfect. Um, I noticed while I'm sitting here that the, what I'm going to talk about is part of the iconography of this lecture series. <laughs> so these diagrams will appear, um, oh, about halfway through the talk, you'll see them. Okay, uh, well, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I've been meeting people from the Valencia High Energy Physics Group all over the world except in Valencia. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be able finally to come here talk to this institution. Uh, the subject is the mysteries of the Higgs boson. So we'll talk about what we know about the Higgs boson, but more especially what we don't know, and maybe some ways to find it out. So, um, well, what is the Higgs boson? It's, I think you folks all know, it is an essential ingredient in what we call the standard model of particle physics. It's the ingredient that allows every other particle in the model, the quarks and leptons that were made out of, the weak bosons that mediate the weak interactions, all of the massive particles of that model, including the Higgs boson itself, to have finite mass. And so this is the um, identity of that particle. It's the reason, presumably, that it exists in nature. It's also the mystery of the particle, because um, what does it take to be the agent of mass generation for all of these other particles in the model? And so that's the thing that I'd like to begin by discussing. Now, if you're a member of the public, I guess, suppose you can swallow anything. But if you're a physicist, the statement that the Higgs boson is necessary to give mass, I think, is very confusing. So um, I illustrate that by this picture. And the question, doesn't stuff have mass? And those of us who only work in non-relativistic physics, everything has mass. And you can hardly define um, the typical domain of atomic physics or even nuclear physics without having the mass of particles be one of your postulates without which you just can't write the first equation. But in relativistic physics, it's actually different. And the situation is more like this collection of household objects. That there are pieces out of which, in a relativistic theory, we build massive particles. And the pieces somehow have to fit together in the right way in order for mass to be allowed to be generated. It's a funny concept, but it's, it really goes back to the foundations of quantum field theory. And so let me just talk a little more about that. So how do you write the equations for particles in quantum field theory? Well, for a scalar field, actually, you can just write down anything you want, and you can put a mass term, and there's no problem. But fields with spin um, are much, more, much trickier to write relativistic quantum field equations. The place to start is the representations of the Lorentz group. And the basic representations of the Lorentz group are actually uh, correspond to massless particles with spin moving at the speed of light. So the sort of things that I've listed here. So, for example, 
An electron, if you want to write the Dirac equation, you can write the Dirac equation, but if you want to understand where the Dirac equation comes from, what you would do fundamentally is to start from an ideal electron moving at the speed of light and spinning in one of the two directions allowed by spin half, either with left-handed spin or with right-handed spin. And there's a similar story for spin one. Actually, you folks know this because you know that Maxwell's equations generates photons which have one unit of angular momentum in the left or right-handed direction. And this state actually doesn't exist as a solution to Maxwell's equations. So um, one then starts from this point of view, and then if you want to make a massive particle, what you have to do are assemble these pieces in a certain way. And the assemblage of pieces for a massive particle is not trivial, as this slide illustrates. So we start over here with a right-handed spinning relativistic electron. If this electron were massless, it could be right-handed spinning forever in every frame of reference. Um, it would be an independent entity in relativistic quantum field theory. However, if we want to give this thing a mass, then we can apply relativistic transformations to it. So if I run fast enough, I can catch up with that particle and it would look like this. And if I ran even faster, or if one of you guys is able to run faster than I am, which is probably correct, it would look like this. And now, please notice, it's turned into a left-handed particle. So mass in quantum field theory is a quantum mechanical mixing process. You take two basic states in different representations of the Lorentz group, and you quantum mechanically mix them to get a massive wave equation. In principle, this is very easy, but there might be a problem that these two states that I'm mixing here have different quantum numbers. And in that case, the mass generation is actually forbidden, and then you have to do something about it. So it would seem like, for example, we work with electrons, we work with protons that are made of quarks, the quarks are massive, the electrons are certainly massive. It would seem like it's very easy to mix the relevant quantum states that we have to work with. But in fact, that's not true. And the reason we know it's not true is because we know so much now about the structure of the weak interactions. The weak interactions mediate beta decay, and they also mediate other interactions, the so-called neutral current interactions. So, um, beta decay, of course, the secret to beta decay, as was discovered very early in the 1950s, is that beta decay violates parity. And one way of expressing how beta decay violates parity is that the things that carry the beta decay interaction, the W boson, in the extreme, in the limit of extreme relativistic motion of the particles, coupled to the left-handed spinning electron, quark, etc., but never to the right-handed spinning quark. That is, this guy interacts with the W boson. This guy doesn't. So these particles have different charges under the weak interactions, but somehow we still have to mix them in order to provide mass. So I just put here a few slides that illustrate our knowledge of the weak interactions. It's really very impressive. Um, this is a, a, the cross-section for electron-positron annihilation to the Z boson, which is a neutral partner of the W boson, another of the basic carriers of weak interactions. Um, the Z boson is unstable, so it has a width. So as you dial the energy, you see it as a resonance. And then if you really understand the theory well, you can predict the resonance line shape. And the slide shows a measurement of the resonance line shape and I apologize to these guys in the front row. The most beautiful measurement of this is actually published by not their experiment at Delphi, but rather by Opal. But look at this. There are arrow bars on those data points. This is a one parameter fit. If you specify the position of the resonance, the detailed shape then can be computed from quantum field theory. Um, you can get it right to about 1% if you just do what's in chapter 20 of my book. And it, it's straightforward. To, to get it right to a tenth of a percent, which it actually is, 
uh, requires some years of computational effort with quantum field theory, but it's, it's straightforward. The theory predicts this. And the agreement between theory and experiment, you've got to admit, is really very impressive. Um, this is another detail more relevant to what we're talking about. This is the decay of the Z boson to the heavy lepton tau. The tau decays by weak interaction, so the decay measures its polarization. And you can actually count the relative number of, oh, yeah, this is another of these experiments that these guys didn't participate in. I'm sorry. Um, you can count the number of left-handed versus right-handed spinning taus that come out of Z decay. And if that number is different, that means that the quantum numbers of those two states are different under the weak interactions. And if the fundamental quantum numbers are different, you can't mix them, and you can't generate a mass. If those quantum numbers were the same, this distribution would be flat, but manifestly it isn't. And it, it is in fantastically good agreement with our theory of weak interactions. OK, so what can you do? Maybe I should just say that all the results I've just showed you are consistent with high precision with the weak interaction theory that was written down in the 1960s by these three guys, Glashow, Salam, and Weinberg. Um, they look very smug in this picture because at, they're just about to receive the Nobel Prize for this achievement. Uh, Mr. Salam, unfortunately, is no longer with us, but I saw Steve Weinberg uh, about a year ago, and he's still looking very smug because no one has been able to overturn this theory in the past 20 or 30 years. But nevertheless, we try, and I'm going to explain to you why it's very important to somehow get beyond this theory. Now, the way this mixing works in the theory is through the Higgs field. The Higgs field is postulated in their theory to be a scalar field which takes values in all of space. And they postulate that it has a potential energy in terms of the magnitude of the Higgs field it looks like this, a typical situation of spontaneously broken symmetry. So when you're sitting down here, the Higgs field has a value which is constant throughout all of space. Anything that couples to the Higgs field feels the effect of this value. The Higgs field transforms under the basic uh, symmetry transformations of the weak interactions. To put it another way, it has charge under the interaction mediated by the W and the Z. And that charge can soak up the difference in charges between the left and right-handed tau, or electron, or quark, and allow the quantum mechanical mixing that we talked about. So it's very similar to superconductivity, actually. And, and in fact, what happens is, again, very similar to the theory of superconductivity. Um, you start from a dispersion relation that looks like this. You turn on the Higgs boson expectation value through spontaneous symmetry breaking. At the zero point here, a mass gap opens up, and you've achieved the mixing that allows quarks, leptons, W and Z bosons to obtain mass. OK. Now, the field which is responsible for the symmetry breaking is a complete mystery. It is this Higgs field. We give it the name, the Higgs field. We might ask how it works. We don't know how it works. And so there are a number of questions that we would like to ask about this field that we're now trying to address experimentally at the Large Hadron Collider and in other places. So um, first of all, does it exist? We now know that this field exists. Why does this field have a spontaneously broken symmetry? Um, to give you the short answer, the long answer is the rest of the lecture, we have no clue. And does the Higgs field have partners? And is there maybe even a Higgs spectroscopy? This is something we would definitely find out in the future. But right now, again, we have no clue what the answer is to this last question. Now, these mysteries are linked to other mysteries of particle physics, which are going to come up as we discuss the properties of the Higgs boson. Um, one of the most important mysteries is the spectrum of quark and lepton masses. Now, remember I told you that the mechanism for generating mass is that a left-handed fermion will come along, feel the influence of this Higgs field, which is in space, 
and flip over to become a right-handed fermion, that quantum mechanical mixing providing the mass cap. Now, in this way, you would think that all quarks should have roughly the same mass if they couple by the same amount to the Higgs field. And that's a true statement in the model, except that they don't. Um, the electron has a mass of half an MeV. The up and down quarks have masses which are uh, quite comparable, a couple MeV. All the units here are in GeV, where the proton mass is just about one GeV. The heaviest known quark is the top quark with a mass of, depending how you count it, 172 or 173 GeV. So this number is 100,000 times this number. And the only thing we can say about that is, well, the top quark couples to the Higgs field with a strength 100,000 times the strength with which the up quark couples to the Higgs field, which you've got to admit is not a very satisfying answer. Um, so the origin of this ratio of couplings is somehow connected to the ratio of couplings to the Higgs boson. But why things are that way is something that we don't know. And actually, our standard model of particle physics coming down from Glashow, Weinberg, and so on is actually powerless to tell us that. These couplings are input parameters to that model. And you can't compute these parameters from within the model. So in order to answer this question, you have to go to some bigger context, which now we're trying to discover. And it, it's an interesting question with which I even stumped the people in the front row. Uh, which is the anomaly? Is it that the T is exceptionally heavy or the U exceptionally light? And actually, different theoretical pictures predict different answers to this question. And we don't know which one is the right one. So uh, yesterday, I gave a talk about um, theories of this type. But in supersymmetry, for example, something that you might have heard about in other colloquia, uh, actually, this is the answer. And T is a completely ordinary quark, even though it weighs 200 times almost the mass of the proton. OK. Now, let's just talk a little about the answer to the first question. Does the Higgs field exist? And that'll give us a warm up into the um, nature of the Higgs properties. A way to find out that the Higgs field exists is to find the quantum of the Higgs field, which is called the Higgs boson. And this property, particle has the property that it couples to each quark, <coughs> lepton, and vector boson proportionally to the mass of that particle. So this tells you immediately what the phenomenology would be of a very heavy Higgs boson. If you had a Higgs boson, if the mass of the Higgs boson were many hundreds of GeV, it would be unstable. It would decay to pairs of W bosons, pairs of Z bosons, and pairs of top quarks, because those are the things to which it couples most strongly. People searched for those decays in many places, especially now at the LHC. We have very strong limits that those processes do not occur. And that implied that the Higgs is actually a much lighter particle, too light to be able to decay to these particular final states. So then you have to search harder and in different ways. Now, if what you would call the dominant decay modes are forbidden energetically, then you have to go to kind of the next level of processes. Particles that have smaller couplings to the Higgs field, but nevertheless, they're light, so the Higgs field can possibly decay into them. And then you can see the Higgs field through these decay processes. So first of all, the next lightest quark, the bottom quark, there we go, the tau lepton, which I told you about. There's some other more interesting modes, which actually have rates that compete with these, even though they're higher order quantum processes. One is where you make a pair of W bosons, but one of the W bosons is what we call off-shell. It's just there as a quantum fluctuation, and very quickly it decays, for example, to a pair of leptons, a pair of electrons, or a pair of muons. So this really looks like a Higgs decay into, let's say, four electrons or four muons. This is a suppressed process because this off-shell business has a high suppression. But this is suppressed because the bottom quark has a very weak coupling to the Higgs boson. So it, it kind of works out. And there's another type of process which is very suppressed. but 
because this is so weak, you can actually have a chance of seeing it, which is one in which the Higgs boson decays, uh, creates a pair of top quarks just as a quantum excitation. And before they figure out that they're off shell, the top quarks annihilate into a pair of gluons or a pair of photons. So this diagram, I guess, is the reverse of uh, the diagram that appears here. So in particular now, you can search for the Higgs boson in all of these modes. And if all of these processes have roughly the same rates, actually Higgs physics becomes very rich experimentally. Because you can measure, imagine measuring individually each of these processes and measuring the whole spectrum of couplings. Uh, here are the predictions of the branching fractions uh, in the standard model. Um, BB bar is supposed to be about 50%. This offshell W about a quarter. Um, gamma gamma, which will come up 0.23%, uh, tenths of a percent level. Um, many of these decay modes will become visible eventually. Many of them are already visible, as I'll show you in this lecture. Um, when the mass of the Higgs boson was known, uh, Fabio Agiolotti, now the director of CERN, and at that time the head of one of the two big LHC experiments, said, thank you, nature. So, so far, so good. Now we have to produce the Higgs boson in high energy experiments, and we have to actually see it. And there is a problem, because the Higgs boson couples strongly only to W, Z, and top, but we don't have any accelerators that produce W, Z, and top. We only have accelerators that accelerate electrons, up quarks, down quarks, and gluons. But fortunately, I showed you that there's a process by which the Higgs can turn into gluons. So if you reverse that, the gluons can turn into the Higgs boson. And then you can get some production of Higgs bosons at the LHC. And the rate of this process is um, this is an outdated number because they raised the energy about 5 times 10 to the minus 10 of the total rate for proton-proton collisions. It's still incredibly small. Nevertheless, one can go find these reactions. Um, now, oddly, the dominant decays to bottom quarks, Ws, are relatively hard to see in the environment in this overwhelming noise of proton-proton collisions. And so the original discovery modes were very rare modes. They were modes in this table corresponding to gamma gamma and to ZZ, where the Zs decay not to quarks but to leptons. But um, the Z branching ratio to leptons is only 6.5%, and then you have to square it. So this is a 10 to the minus 3 decay mode. This to leptons is a 10 to the minus 4 decay mode. And you have to multiply those numbers. Where am I going? You have to multiply those numbers into this number, which is already incredibly small. So you design your triggers very carefully. You take tens of petabytes of data. You sort through it for individual events, and they turn out to be there. So this is a, a, an event display from the CMS experiment. There's no track. There's electromagnetic deposition. So these are two gamma rays whose mass sums to the what is supposed to be the mass of the Higgs boson. Um, here's a candidate event from Atlas. Um, this is probably the only event, the Higgs event, that I'm going to show you, which is actually likely to be a Higgs boson and not background. But here you can see um, two electrons with a track and electromagnetic deposition, and two extremely penetrating particles, which are muons. And then if you add up the four, four vectors, you get uh, this number. So when you look at the statistics, um, what you have is uh, a resonance bump in the two photon spectrum, uh, background subtracted, it actually looks quite impressive, and um, even more impressive bump until you look at the numbers. Um, there are about 20 events in this whole peak, but this is a very definite resonance where something is decaying into four levels. And so we're very sure now that this particle exists. It cannot be produced by the other particles of the standard model, so it's, it's something new. And as we'll see, it has the properties that are predicted for the Higgs boson. So this is about where we are in terms of the qualitative properties predicted. 
We've seen the gamma gamma decay mode. We've seen the, oh, you don't see the pointer, but that's fine. Um, we've seen the Z decay mode. We've actually seen the W decay mode. I'll show you some of the evidence for that later in the talk. The tau plus tau minus decay mode. Again, these things I'll discuss a little later. There's some very preliminary evidence that the Higgs decays to BB bar. This is not yet a five sigma discovery. Um, the Higgs to TT bar coupling at the moment is controversial, although if you believe that the dominant mechanism for the glue-glue production is through top quarks, uh, this must be there. And actually, one can even check the spin parity, and it turns out to be zero plus, as predicted by the glashow weinberg salon model. So, um, and if you look at the rates of these processes, um, this is a compilation from a couple of years ago, but in the new run of the OHC, it hasn't really changed all that much. Um, these are ratios of rates for Higgs production in various channels times Higgs decay and the observation in the channels that are listed. Um, this is not working, but that's fine. Um, the uh, zero is no Higgs boson. One is the prediction of the standard model. And as you see, these uh, the data clusters around one. So roughly, let's say within 30% accuracy, we are now seeing at the LHC what this model predicts. OK, so far so good. But the fact that the Higgs boson is real gets you worried about the other two questions that I listed on that slide. Uh, why does the Higgs boson exist? Why does it do what it does? Why does it have this potential which causes spontaneous symmetry breaking? Um, and this is something that we as yet do not understand. And so now what I'd like to do is to talk to you a little about, about that, about the explanation for the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the standard model and in some sense what we can do about it. Now, the standard model has this picture of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, which is very simple. There is a scalar field. It um, has a potential which is minimized at a non-zero value. Uh, in the standard model, the potential is actually restricted by renormalizability to have this very simple form. And then you just postulate that this parameter mu squared is less than zero, which is, let's just say, not a very convincing explanation of a profound physical phenomenon. You can try to compute the value of mu squared in the standard model. But if you do that, you run into all kinds of difficulties. And in fact, even the first radiative correction gives you all kinds of difficulties. So for example, we can compute a diagram with a Higgs self-interaction, which corrects the mu parameter. And it corrects it by a term which is actually ultraviolet diversion. So you have to control somehow the infinity of this diagram. It's a positive correction. The Higgs also couples, I told you, very strongly to the top quark. So you could compute this Feynman diagram, which corrects mu squared. That turns out to be a negative correction. Again, it's infinite. And you need some kind of a broader theory to tell you how to make this finite and what the value is. And obviously, if there's one infinite positive correction and one infinite negative correction, it's clear you can get any answer you want. And um, well, that's where we are. That's where we are today, is this situation. Uh, presumably, what happens is that there are new particles whose diagrams also contribute to this sum, which would somehow cancel these infinities and give us a finite value. And if we have a well-constructed theory, then maybe even that finite value would be negative and would be a prediction of electroweak symmetry breaking. But those particles have not yet been discovered, so that's still speculation. Now, for me, there's a strong analogy here to the theory of superconductivity. The potential that I wrote um, back on this slide is exactly the potential for the order parameter of superconductivity that was written down by Landau and Ginsberg in 1950. Um, their argument for superconductivity was exactly the same as this argument. The superconducting order parameter, we don't know what it is. We'll postulate that it's a scalar field. We'll write down the simplest potential. We make this assumption for T below Tc of the superconductor. 
This turned out to be a fantastically useful theory. It predicts the phase diagram, the discontinuity of the specific heat, the existence of the Abercrombie vortices, the difference between type 1 and type 2 superconductors, the critical currents, many other things can be predicted by this theory. But fundamentally, it's vacant at the core because it relies on some assumptions which are arbitrary and not physical. And this is exactly where we are now in particle physics. We have the analog of the Landau-Ginzburg theory, but we don't yet have the BCS theory. And in fact, we're in a worse situation than um, the materials guys were back in the 50s because we don't know what the particles are that play the role of the electrons and the phonons in the BCS theory. Those particles, we know that you can't make them out of the particles of the standard model because people have tried very hard and failed. Um, they must be some new particles, and we haven't yet discovered them. So for me, I think this is one of the big opportunities of particle physics now. These, if you believe the story I told you, these new particles must, must exist. If they make the Higgs potential, they must have an energy scale, which is hundreds or maybe thousands of GeV, but no further, because their dynamics create this potential, which we know has a depth of about 100 GeV. Um, in condensed matter physics, the physics of phase transitions is really fascinating. The mechanisms are typically not obvious, and they, do, they involve all kinds of very interesting physical mechanisms. And so for particle physics, this is the opportunity. It's somewhere in the future. Um, hopefully soon we'll see it happen. This is a slide that I like to give to particle physics audiences just to talk them. Um, this is a pneumatic liquid crystal. The reason for the phase transition in this case is that the molecules that are ordering have this funny flat and elongated shape. So uh, are there flat and elongated particles that interact with the Higgs field? I don't know. It could be, could be true. Let me make a first try at a theory of electroweak symmetry breaking, um, using only ingredients that we know about today. So let's introduce a Higgs field, and let's couple top quarks to it. And of course, we know there are top quarks, and we know they have a relatively strong interaction to the Higgs field. And I want to postulate, I don't know where this comes from, the potential for the Higgs field, which is totally flat. So there's no preference for expectation value zero or a non-zero expectation value. And then let's just see what happens. So what happens comes from the physics of the Dirac C. You know, excuse me, when you quantize the Dirac equation, what you find is that there are positive and negative energy states. And Dirac said, well, it's clear, fermions, you can only put one in a state, so let's fill the negative energy states. There's a gap between here and here. We interpret that gap as twice the mass of the electron. We can move an electron from here to here creating a particle of the electron in the hole that we interpret as a positron. Now, if the, if the Higgs field had zero expectation value, there would be no gap. This would be totally closed, but the states would still be filled up to zero, and then they'd be empty above that. If you now let the Higgs field slide a little so that it acquires a vacuum expectation value, you open this gap, and the energy of the system goes down. So that's fabulous. We're in business. We can make a theory of electroweak symmetry breaking. The only problem with this is that it, there's nothing that stops it. It goes down forever. And this is actually a problem we've already seen. It's the reason that there's a negative infinity when we compute this Feynman diagram, which I showed you before. The top quark induces the Higgs to have a vacuum expectation value to break the symmetry of the standard model. But it doesn't induce it in a way that we can control mathematically or understand physically what the outcome is. It just basically takes everything and sends it to infinite mass, unless we somehow have this mechanism embedded in the context of a broader theory. So the next thing to do is to see, well, can we save this idea? It's a pretty interesting idea. It just doesn't work. 
but maybe if we embed it in a broader context, we can find a way to save it and to try and actually build a theory out of which we can compute the Higgs potential. So basically, there were three big suggestions for how to do that. The first one is something called Technicolor, where you postulate, um, we understand now the theory of the strong interactions, QCD, hadron physics. We understand that very well. Um, we've been studying hadrons since the 1950s, and our understanding of that is now very precise. And it comes from a gauge theory called quantum chromodynamics. So in the 70s, Weinberg and uh, Lennon Susskind said, well, why don't we just postulate another gauge theory similar to quantum chromodynamics, but with a mass scale of about 1,000 GeV, 1 TeV. Then they showed, if you couple the weak interactions to that theory, the same way that the W and Z bosons couple to quarks, they naturally form condensates, break the symmetry, give you an effective scalar field that you can interpret as a Higgs field. It's fabulous, except that scalar field turns out to be very heavy. It has a mass of about 1 TeV. And so now that we've discovered the Higgs boson as a resonance at 125 GeV, this theory is just out the window. Throw it in the wastebasket, go on to option two. Um, the other thing that you can try to do is to introduce a symmetry that forbids the Higgs field from getting mass. So then you at least have a symmetry that gives you the starting point of the previous argument, a flat potential surface along which the Higgs vacuum expectation value can move. The most successful example of such a theory is something called supersymmetry, which has actually a lot of magical properties that control infinities in a way that are very nice for making this argument. In this theory, every quark has a partner, which is a scalar field, the so-called squark. Every lepton has a partner, the slepton. Every W boson has a partner, which is called the wino or wino, something like that. Um, every particle has a partner whose statistics are opposite and whose spin differs by half a unit. In particular, there is a scalar top quark whose loop diagram exactly cancels the diagram that I showed you from the top quark. So the infinity goes away, but also the drive to spontaneous symmetry break. However, it turns out that if the top squarks have a mass, there's another Feynman diagram, which is very straightforward to compute, that generates a finite negative correction to mu squared. And that is actually a mechanism of spontaneous symmetry break. This kind of model predicts that these particles exist. And so uh, there's been an intensive search for those particles at the LHC. Another type of model is to say the Higgs boson is composite. And it's the compositeness that cuts off the infinities. So you, what you can imagine is that if the Higgs boson is composite, it interacts with the top quark. The top quark must also be composite. And then the compositeness regulates that Feynman diagram. So basically, the Dirac C goes down until you begin to see the compositeness of top quarks and Higgs bosons, and then the evolution stops. And you have a mechanism for stabilizing the spontaneous symmetry breaking at a certain value. Uh, these models are very cool. Um, and actually, they make some interesting predictions. Uh, they predict that there are heavy partners of both the Higgs boson and the top quark. Those partners play an intricate role when you actually do find the diagram calculations. And typically, I don't know if this happens in every model, but, but the typical result is that when you calculate the diagrams that contribute to the Higgs mass, they turn out to be regulated correctly and negative. So you retain this idea that the top quark drives electronic symmetry. So now we need to test these theories. And to test these theories, what we need to do is to do some number of things. First of all, these theories predict a lot of new particles that are not predicted in the standard model, so we need to go look for them. And that search has been going on in a very intense way at the CERN Large Hadron Collider, the LHC. Um, 
the story of those searches is actually fascinating. Actually, the reason that I'm in Europe right now is that last week I attended a meeting where a lot of people who are doing those searches got together and talked about you know, what else we can look for, what are the things we can try, what are the different strategies. It, it's a really interesting story, but unfortunately that's the subject of another colloquium. So what I'd like to do now is to talk about the other way that you can go after tests of these theories, which is to take the particles that we know exist, in particular the Higgs boson in the top part, and examine their properties in much more detail and try and see whether from those properties we can understand the signs that one or another of these theories I showed you is correct. So let's talk a little about that. Now, you would think that if the Higgs boson is composite, if there are multiple Higgs bosons, if the Higgs boson has supersymmetric partners, the so-called Higgsinos, that this would be obvious in the Higgs property, maybe even of order one. But it turns out that that's not a correct statement. There's a barrier to this, which um, proved by my friend Howard Haber called the decoupling theorem. And the decoupling theorem has the following statement. If the Higgs sector contains one light boson of mass 125 GeV, and many heavy particles that we have not discovered yet with minimum mass m, the light boson has properties that agree with the standard model predictions up to corrections of order mh squared over m squared. So if mh is 125 GeV and m is, let's say, 500 GeV, then these corrections are at the few percent level. And what I showed you before is that we've experimentally probed the Higgs to about the 20 or 30 percent level. So you could say the agreement with the standard model that we've seen so far is perfectly to be expected. It's consistent with the statement that the LHC has not yet discovered new particles. And when we discover new particles, and if we can probe the Higgs better, we might actually see both sides of this. The new particles at many hundreds of GeV creating corrections at the percent level of accuracy. Uh, the proof is given for experts in elementary particle physics. Integrate out the heavy fields. The result is the standard model. Um, in the standard model, the couplings of the Higgs boson are totally predicted. The corrections come from some dimension six quantum field theory operators. The coefficients of those operators have the scaling on the previous slide. So that was very quick. Ask your particle physics friends to explain the proof. They can at least nod and say, yes, I just proved it. Okay. The implication is that if we really want to go after the Higgs properties, what we have to do is to figure out how to measure the Higgs couplings at the percent level. And so um, let me talk a little about the patterns of corrections and then a little about how um, what's interesting about the Higgs boson, from this point of view, is the thing that uh, Fabiola Giannotti was so excited about when the Higgs was discovered at a very low mass. The Higgs has a very rich pattern of decays that allow individual measurements of its couplings. And it turns out, from the theory point of view, that these, each of these couplings has, in some sense, its own personality as I'd like to illustrate to you in the next few slides. The fermion couplings are things that indicate whether the Higgs has partners, whether there are multiple Higgs bosons. The gauge boson couplings signal the presence of singlets, extra scalar fields that don't couple to the weak interactions, but only mix with the Higgs bosons. The photon-photon and glue-glue couplings signal so-called heavy vector-like particles, the partners of the top quark. Obviously, the top coupling will signal possible compositeness of the top quark. And one can also talk about the Higgs self-coupling. I think that's an area I'm not going to get into in this talk. Um, the picture is similar, maybe, to the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background, viewed at the even the 1% level of accuracy, is a thermal distribution that's uniform in the universe, and it comes from everywhere. There, when you need to get down to the level of 10 to the minus 5 to extract cosmological information. And then 
You learn everything about cosmology from studying those corrections. So for the Higgs boson, I'm saying you only have to get to 10 to the minus 2. But um, let me just give a few illustrations of what might be there. So if you have multiple uh, Higgs fields, um, this is one. You can get deviations, for example, in the, um, this is the uh, lepton and quark couplings of, as you see, the few percent level as you go along these lines. Um, in supersymmetry, there are other corrections which become relevant, uh, corrections where the partners of the bottom and top quark appear in quantum loops. Those corrections can be quite large, but again, you see the scale that we're talking about is the 5% level of deviations as those particles go to very high mass values where, you know, at the time this slide was written, the particles could have been here, but right now the limits are about here at the OHC. Um, this is another slide which makes the same point in a very interesting way, uh, done by some of my Slack colleagues, uh, Joanne Hewitt and Tom Rizzo. Um, they created uh, a quarter of a million models of supersymmetry consistent with all known constraints, and they asked what the deviation is of the Higgs to BB bar decay rate. So the fractional, um, the ratio of the deviation is given on the bottom here. Um, these correspond to some precision measurements that I would tell you about yesterday. It peaks at 1. So usually the deviations are very small. It's a log scale with a lot of uh, decades on it. The colors show how these models would be eaten away by successive eras of search at the OHC. So it's kind of interesting that the Higgs coupling measurement is orthogonal to the progress we'll make in looking for supersymmetry by going to higher energy and higher luminosity at the OHC. And that's a very interesting point, which makes it interesting to pursue this line of investigation and at the same time keep hoping that we'll find these particles at the OHC. Um, the coupling of the Higgs boson to vector bosons is very simple in the standard model. It turns out in supersymmetry that suppression is correct. It's, is, um, sorry, the Correction is suppressed. <laughs> it's um, not one over the heavy particle mass to the squared, but actually to the fourth. But this is a good thing because there are lots of other models that predict corrections in this channel. So these corrections are order one over m squared, as you see. And so those would be present in those models, whereas they would be absent in supersymmetry. And these models have to do with mixing of the Higgs with a singlet scalar field or compositeness of the Higgs, where F here is the parameter analogous to the pi on decay constant F pi, which somehow gives the scale of the hadron <coughs> physics in the new interactions. Um, the decays, where the Higgs decays to loop diagrams, obviously, in addition to the top quark and the W in the loop, you could have any heavy particle. And so those particles also can contribute. The typical values, again, are at the few percent level. And um, maybe I should say that there's some interesting ambiguity. If you have both corrections to the top quark from compositeness and the possible presence of new particles, but if you can measure these loop decays and measure the direct coupling of the Higgs boson to the top quark using, for example, the diagram which is shown here, then you can disentangle these effects and figure out what comes from what. In models where the Higgs boson is composite, the top quark, as I said, typically is also composite, and you get especially large corrections. And here are just some uh, slides that people have produced where CT is the correction to the Higgs top, top coupling. Um, here you can get for, this is at a TEV scale, so for reasonable values, even 20% corrections to that coupling. And maybe I should say in the same class of models, um, these, blue these purple points indicate particular model predictions for the coupling of the top quark to the Z boson that comes from top quark compositeness. Um, the LHC ability to see these is somewhat limited. It's given by the blue circle. We'll, we'll talk about how you get to the red circle in just a moment. Putting all of the effects together, we find patterns of deviations which are different in the different classes of models. 
And so this now becomes really interesting. If you could make these percent level measurements, you could tell the left-hand side from the right-hand side. The left-hand side, in terms of the physical intuition that I've given you, is an indication for supersymmetry or some kind of model with extra Higgs fields. The right-hand side is an indication for a model with Higgs boson and top compositeness. So one has the ability to read the pattern of corrections from the standard model and then try and figure out from that what's actually going on. Okay. Now, um, so that's what I said here. Um, now, how do we go about this? Well, in the next 20 years, we're really going to learn a lot more about the Higgs boson from the LHC as the precision of the measurements improves. But I think in terms of, now the LHC can do a lot of very interesting things, and in particular this colloquium that I didn't give you about the new particle searches. The power of the LHC is very large, and it's still there. And actually the optimal era for new particle discovery at the LHC is the next few years, between now and let's say 2020. So please keep your ears open for news on that front. But for the precision Higgs, my feeling is the LHC is not going to get there. And I think the reasons for this are made clear by looking at the current evidence for the Higgs boson in the various DK channels. So for example, here's the evidence uh, from the Atlas experiment for the Higgs decay to WW. So the Ws are each seen in a decay to a lepton in the neutrino. So you have an event where the protons collide there's the usual jump, but nothing much happens. And two leptons come out. And there's also unobserved missing momentum from the two neutrinos. Unfortunately, the same signature is generated when two quarks annihilate and produce a pair of W bosons. And the signals are not very distinct. So if you make cuts to enhance the probability that those events are Higgs-like rather than W-like, you get some plots that look like this. So the top line, let me try and remember what this is. The top line are no extra jets. The bottom line is one extra jet. By the time you get to two extra jets, the whole um, slide would be dominated by background from top quark production. So you can't go there. Um, the uh, variable here is the mass of the two lepton system, which, for which a small value slightly favors Higgs light. The blue areas are the background from w, direct WW production. And the little red sliver is the background, is the signal that you're looking for. And as you see from the slide, that signal is actually there. It's statistically significant. And if you add up all the data points at about the five sigma level, so you've discovered this enhancement. But to measure this enhancement to 1%, you have to understand the blue um, aqua and, in particular, the yellow stuff from the top quark to a fraction of a percent level, which is really beyond the level of our technology for understanding these kinds of standard model reactions. Um, here's a slide that I showed you before, but now I want to show it to you again. This is a very beautiful event display corresponding to what we call um, vector boson fusion production of the Higgs boson and decay to a pair of tau leptons. So you see the tau lepton as an electron here producing an electromagnetic signal, and a muon, which is very penetrating, one the decay product of the tau plus, the other the decay product of the tau minus. Unfortunately, this slide has only a small chance of being a Higgs boson. Um, here's what the event distribution of the tau masses looks like. Uh, the, the tan area is the process z to tau plus tau minus. The little sliver here is Higgs to tau plus tau minus. If you do a background subtraction, you see it's a very significant signal. But once again, it limits the accuracy to which you can measure that signal. And remember, we have to get below the percent level. Um, this is the current step, actually no longer the current status, but the um, status from one, run one of the search for Higgs to BB bar. Uh, the red is the Higgs signal, the brown is the signal from uh, Z production of BB bar. Um, it looks great until you turn the page one back, 
And so these are the distributions from which that's derived. So now here are all the standard model backgrounds that need to be computed. The Higgs signal is this red thing. And um, once again, it could be there, but um, it's one thing to discover it, which uh, we're very close to doing at the LHC, another to measure it to high precision. There's one special case, which is that um, Higgs to gamma gamma and Higgs to four leptons are very easy to pick out. These are the original discovery signals. And um, let, let me just say that the result of the analysis on this slide is that we will have a very accurate measurement, hopefully as low as the 2%, for the ratio of these two branching ratios, which we can bring into a later Higgs study. So now, finally, there is a proposed accelerator that's capable of meeting the goals of the Precision Higgs program. And it's one that I'm very interested in, and I guess some of my friends here also, which is called the International Linear Collider. This is an electron-positron collider that produces, among other things, reactions, various reactions of the Higgs boson. Either the reaction E plus E minus goes to a Z boson recoiling against the Higgs boson or E plus E minus producing a pair of W bosons, so the final state is two neutrinos, invisible particles, and the Higgs boson central in the detector. Um, slowly, this accelerator is gaining momentum. Um, I'm frankly very optimistic that in the next few years, it will actually be approved for construction in Japan. In this place, the Kitakami Mountain Range, um, here is a photograph of the meeting of the project head, Lynn Evans, actually the guy who uh, directed the construction of the LHC, with uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe. The cast of characters here is quite interesting. Um, this is uh, my friend, uh, theorist, uh, Hitoshi Moriyama. This is Koshiba, the Japanese Nobel Prize winner for the Kamiokondo Neutrino Program. The eminence grease over here is uh, uh, Mr. Kanemura, the former governor of Iwata province, which is where this place is, and now one of the very high-ranking officials in the Liberal Democratic Party. So there's uh, political impetus, and there's also local impetus. If you go down the road to Morioka, you see signs like this. If your Japanese is good, you can see that that reads international when you're a color. <laughs> So finally, here are a few snapshots from the physics expectations for the ILC. Uh, here are the uh, processes that produce Higgs. As you change the energy, the initial energy will be 500 GeV. You can change from the process where you produce the Z with the Higgs to the process where you produce the Z with neutrinos. They have separate systematics and separate advantages. So if you measure both, you can put them together and learn more things. Um, here is the, in the Higgs Z process, the uh, recoil, uh, the um, mass of the Higgs as inferred from the energy of the recoil of the Z. So when you produce a Higgs at the peak of the Higgs cross section, the Z goes off at an energy of 113 GeV. If you see a Z boson of that energy, on the other side, whatever it is, it's a Higgs. So you can measure the mass very accurately. Uh, the claim is to 15 MeV. You can measure um, invisible decays, which I guess I'll show you later. You can look for processes like these. So here are muons, which are very penetrating. Um, here is the result of a Z decay to BB bar. It's very visible. Actually, you can see the primary B the secondary B decay vertex here and the tertiary vertex of B to charm, which is a beautiful way to tag bees possible in this environment. You can separate the events into classes, so you can separately measure a Higgs to BB bar and two processes that are just totally invisible at the LHC, Higgs to CC bar and Higgs to glue glue, each with a percent level of accuracy. Um, here is the signal for Higgs to invisible seen by seeing the Z at the fixed energy and then nothing on the other side. This is a very big signal, a branching fraction of 10%. But you can see that if it were 1%, it would be quite visible over the backgrounds in this diagram, which, by the way, are much easier to compute than the backgrounds at the OHC. 
And finally, here's a summary of where we expect to get to in terms of the Higgs coupling precision. So this line here is the 1% level. The red is the initial stage. The yellow is with a foreseen luminosity upgrade. Um, almost everything gets to an accuracy below 1%. Um, the exceptions are the top quark, for which a little more energy buys you something. If you can get to an energy of 550, this comes down actually by a factor of two. Uh, Higgs to mu plus v minus, the branching ratio is just too small for this. Although, if you went to higher energy, the rates become larger. Higgs to gamma gamma, again, the rate is very small and it's kind of hopeless for this experiment to do it on its own. But if we've done the LHC measurements of gamma gamma to ZZ, we can put that together with the information for this machine, again, to get to the 1% level in the value of that coupling. So it's a comprehensive program addressing the issues that I've been talking about in the last half hour. Okay, well, that's the end of the story. The Higgs boson has, we've discovered it, but it has many secrets which remain hidden. Those secrets include many of the most important questions in particle physics. Uh, we can go after the origin of those secrets by searching for new particles at the LHC, and that'll be a very exciting development in the next few years. But over a longer time scale, we can go in, as it were, an orthogonal way to measure with precision the properties of the Higgs boson and the top quark and look for evidence of the various models that I've discussed with you. And I think after the LHC, this is going to be the great crusade in particle physics. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope that you folks will also find it interesting. And um, I hope that uh, maybe I won't, but some of my successors will come back and report to you the very interesting results of this experimental program. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. The first question should come from someone who can shout because What scalars? I'm sorry. Uh, charge scalars. So oh, yes. Scalar. So they can enter the Higgs to gamma gamma loop in the same way, and they will not decouple in the same sense that the top quark will not decouple. So in those models, you can show that even the charge scalar masses of the at the TEV scale, there can be as large as 10 percent suppression in in uh, new gamma gamma. Uh, I'm, now I'm confused. Is the dependence one over the charge scalar mass squared, Actually, and it just has a large coefficient? Ooh, there must be a dependence on something. We'll talk about it later. As I say, I, well, there's some special circumstance that I've missed, so let's talk about it later. Okay, I got the microphone in the meantime. Please. Um, well, there, I mean, ILC is a formal proposal to the Japanese government, and that formal proposal gives the energy as 500 GeV. Um, a formal proposal comes with a bill, mm -hmm. so if you want a higher energy, you should tell me how to pay for it. Actually, um, there was a design change to make it 10% longer at the expense of something else, some uh, shielding that was thought to be uh, over-designed. So, in principle, the ILC, as designed, can actually run at 550. And I told you that's very important. It lowers the uh, error on the top quark TT bar Higgs coupling by a factor of two, just making that little change in energy because you're so close to threshold. But 700, 800, 
um, you know, that's, that's not in the current plan. Um, now, in the ILC TDR, it, there is a design for increasing the energy to one TeV. And the site plan has room to make the accelerator longer, so eventually it can reach one TeV. At one TeV, you're measuring the TT bar H coupling to 2%, you're measuring the Higgs self-coupling to uh, 10 or 15%, depending on how long you run. Um, you're actually seeing the Higgs to mu plus mu minus decay. Um, if the ILC is constructed, someday we'll get there but it's not in the original plan. Yeah, if I, if I can add quickly, that the technology in principle is there. So if there is a new particle, like the X750, but real, um, that tells us we should run at 700 or at one and a half TeV, then one can make a linear collider that gets there. Yeah. Actually, we wrote a, we wrote a paper about this. Uh, in section four, it explains that how you would use the, TD, the TDR design to discover and measure the properties of this 750 GeV thing. But apparently that doesn't exist, so <laughs> it's moved. But if it were there, we could do it. Uh, yes? Can you make some comment about vacuum instability? Uh, probably related with the shape of the X potential uh, and uh, on the normalization of the lambda coupling. Oh, um, this is something that some people in the community feel very strongly about it, and I happen not to be one of them. Um, I've already convinced you, I think, that I really believe that there are new particles at, the, at, at most the few TeV energy scale. And those new particles influence the nature of the Higgs potential as you extrapolate it to very large values of the Higgs vacuum expectation value. However, if you believe that the standard model is literally true up to the Planck scale, what you discover is that top parks loops renormalize the shape of the potential. So there's the dip here where we, we live. And then it goes up by many orders of magnitude. And then the top park influence comes in and it comes down again. And eventually, with the current preferred value of the top park mass, it comes down before you get to the Planck scale and becomes lower than the minimum that we're in. So in the standard model, with the current, value, current best values of the parameters taken absolutely literally, our universe is not stable. In a time of about 10 to the 100 years, we expect to tunnel from where we are to this vacuum with a very high value of the Higgs vacuum expectation value. That tunneling process will involve the nucleation of a bubble that will come roaring at us at almost the speed of light. Um, probably by the time we see it, we will have only, um, I think, nanoseconds before we are engulfed by it. And the entire matter of which we're made will be transmuted into another form. But fortunately, we've got 10 to the 100 years to wait. <laughs> so it's a great story. But if there is indeed new physics at the TeV scale, um, it becomes totally moot. Uh, the whole situation of physics changes before you get to these very high values. So then, maybe you can say that uh, this is pointing out that the standard model cannot be the only theory up to the Planck scale. Well, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, there's always this question, is it a bug or a feature? So, um, you know, my friends who work on multiple universes um, claim that they under some circumstances can prove a theorem that our vacuum must be unstable. And then they say, well, the standard model's unstable. That proves we must be right. <laughs> okay, you, you have to talk about the, the measurement of coupling of the Higgs to find you. Yes. That's a very important task. But, uh, to, if you want to check this coupling, because this one will have the it will have the contribution of the standard Higgs because it's there and something else. But when you have something else, it, there is a tendency to have labor changes in the coupling. Yes. Unless you put by hand some symmetry or so. So there is a lot of couplings that must be studied at LHC and also at the linear collider that are the Higgs flavor changing coupling. Could you comment on the performance of the linear collider in this? Even for, for example, reactive decays, top, top to 
Well, there, so, there are all kinds of ways of answering that question. So let me give you three of them. The first one is that right now the constraints on standard model, on flavor changing couplings from beyond the standard model physics are very strong already from what we know about BDK, the absence of uh, mu d gamma, um, a, a number of pieces of evidence eliminate many possible flavor changing couplings that might be there in extensions of the standard model. And um, so it doesn't have to be true that the theory of the Higgs boson has new flavor changing couplings. And in fact, in the models that I described to you, um, it, it is possible to reduce those couplings in the model building to a level where they don't affect these experiments. Now that doesn't mean the effects can't be there. It's just, um, it's theoretically consistent to talk about a world where the effects are not there. Uh, on the other hand, if there are multiple Higgs bosons, it is allowed that the Higgs bosons themselves can change flavor, and their couplings might actually be flavor violating. Um, in run one of the LHC, there was some two sigma, two and a half sigma evidence for a decay of Higgs to tau mu. And I thought this was something really fascinating. Um, it requires multiple Higgs bosons. It has a very interesting, if you build models, a very interesting theoretical structure. That now seems to have gone away, but it could reappear at a lower level. And um, I, you know, I think you know, that's, I mean, many anomalies are not interesting to me because they don't have interesting theory associated with them. But the theory of this one would be very interesting. Um, and then the third thing, of course, is the difference between top and bottom and maybe tau and the other generations. So maybe there are symmetries that protect the lighter generations from having flavor changing neutral currents, but especially top, it could be really different. And one of the interesting things there is what happens to bottom. Bottoms in the same multiple as top. We've studied bottom in ZDKs to very high precision. There don't seem to be any anomalies. Is that consistent with the models that I was telling you about? The answer is yes, but it's quite subtle, and it's a constraint on these models. So, uh, yeah, a lot of questions there too. I'm sorry. Okay. Further questions? So we'll clear from here. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much.